Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Thanks for coming today. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm a teacher at Siskoi Valley Union High School. I went to Siskoi Valley Union High School and graduated from there in 1993. Uh, and teaching at my old high school, teaching history at, at my old high school, has been uh, incredibly rewarding. For the last 15 or 16 years, some of you may know Ed Daniels. He was um, the state and local teacher at MVU. When I was hired, I was hired to teach that class, um, partly because of my love of politics. But then over the last two or three years, the state has asked schools to change how we grade students. So MVU took a look at its course offerings. And I'll still be teaching a little bit of the, um, the civics or the government. But right now, the primary class that I'm teaching is uh, a local history class. And uh, part of the curriculum or part of what we've developed for that local history class is to get the MVU junior and senior classes visiting all of the historical societies. So last year we went to the Highgate Historical Society, we visited the Swanton Historical Society, and um, we came here too. And uh, what the St. Albans Historical Society has here is, is very impressive. Um, uh, being a public school teacher, um, School is in session today. Uh, I was able to take a professional day. Um, but I, I want to thank you um, for inviting me. Uh, there is a little bit of payment that goes along with this. But the payment that I'm going to receive is going to go back to the Swanton Historical Society. Um, I, I mention that um, because you guys are property taxpayers. And in order for me to be able to do what I want to do with my local history class, um, it costs a lot of money to um, have students go to different locations and to visit different sites. Uh, there's also a certain benefit. Um, I can't thank people enough for the idea of paying me for something that I love to research in the first place. Um, so I appreciate it. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, happy Halloween. <laughs> Uh, there was one witch outfit earlier. I don't know where that individual went. Um, usually at school, I would be dressed in a Halloween outfit as well. Um, some of my favorites are the Joker from the Batman movies um, or different political uh, people from history. Um, also, uh, I should recognize, since uh, this is um, history-based and sometimes rare historical events deserve uh, significant attention. Uh, congratulations to the Red Sox for winning the World Series. Uh, I think of my grandfather, Kenneth Barney. Um, he was born in 1918, and when I was growing up, he always joked that um, he was going to stay alive until the Red Sox won the World Series. So I remember the night in 2004. Uh, Grandpa was in his late 80s at that point in time, but I still called him at about midnight when the Red Sox won. Um, so. Congratulations to the Red Sox. Um, thanks for being here. Um, the presentation is on prohibition. Uh, this is a presentation that I've done for the Swanton Historical Society. Um, and uh, I want to let you know that I'm not a true expert um, on prohibition. Um, I did quite a bit of research for this. And I'll talk about the research methods that I used for the presentation. Um, my true areas of interest right now, and my students at MBU are seeing this, are uh, the War of 1812. Um, mentioned the book, and, and thank you for doing that. Uh, that's going to be published by the History Press next year. Another area of interest for me right now is uh, the Native American presence in northwest Vermont. Uh, I'm spending an awful lot of time uh, researching and kind of connecting the dots on some of that material as well. Um, so how did this come about? Uh, sitting on the Swanton Historical Society board, uh, we sometimes at our meetings just talk about what sort of presentations we want to offer to the public. Uh, in my mind, it works in a very anniversary way. So with the 100-year anniversary of Prohibition here, um, we had talked and we thought that that would be another, another good thing to do. Um, there's another 100-year anniversary that probably deserves some attention, uh, and that would be women getting the right to vote. Um, I haven't put anything together for that presentation yet, but um, at the Swanton Historical Society, we're, we're always trying to think of good uh, material to cover. So um, I do keep a journal, and I made sure to write down all of the notes, things that I wanted to cover. I do the same thing in my history classes as well. Um, 
So um, I'm sure you are aware this area is incredibly rich in history, um, starting with Native American history throughout the revolution, uh, the War of 1812, going up through the Civil War, uh, Prohibition, the topic for today, this area is one of the um, most historically significant areas of the country. Uh, and I think it's neat that I'm teaching at the high school and my job allows me to do um, these sorts of presentations. So, so I think I want to start off um, to, with kind of questioning you guys. Um, as a teacher, I always get very nervous if I'm giving a presentation and it's only me speaking. Uh, so I'm not going to call on anybody in the, in the audience, but what I would like from you guys are um, family stories. Um, and not too much information, but kind of relevant to the topic that we're talking about here. Uh, I'm just curious. I have had the opportunity to connect some names with faces as some of you were coming in. I said hello. Um, I'm just curious. Is there anybody in the room who has a family story that you're aware of that you could connect to the Prohibition time period that you would like to share with people? The gentleman in the Red Sox cap. Well, actually, my father was that the unique ice cream parlor on Main Street in Gaines Block, and they had it from 1925 to 1940. Well, 1933 was when Prohibition was taken down. They were the first ones in town with the beer like the list of liquor ones. So the wine's coming out of that restaurant. <laughs> and all the way up to the I've heard many stories about liquor licenses. Are there any family histories? Any family pictures or, or anything that you guys captured from that? Another story I probably shouldn't even get you into. I had three uncles. They get caught in taking Chinese across the border. Ah. Uh. Right during that period of rain. Two of them, I think, were not American citizens yet. They were reported back to Canada. My father got a lot drink off the boat and got his car back. That's another story. That's something. <laughs> But, but the topics are certainly linked. Um, we are so close to the border that the topics are certainly linked. Anybody else willing to share a family story or know of properties that may have been exploited one way or the other? Yeah. I don't have a family story, but in the Richford um, history book, there's a story of a farm up on near the border, and they used to report cars racing across. One morning they came out, and there was a baby coffin sitting on their front porch. They never, called, they never called the police again. Herdebees, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, yes. Uh, Richford has a pretty extensive history with prohibition. <laughs> There's another hand well, here. I know the Richford Historical Society, and a lot of people here, I'm sure, have heard of Queen Will. Yeah. Up, on the, uh, up in East Richford, where her hotel was partly on the American side. Uh, it's probably, there's probably so many stories that that location alone is probably worth a book. I think they have, I've people quite often come from Canada looking for information on Queen Hill. Yeah. It probably is a book out there somewhere. Anybody else? So I guess another question uh, before I start with the presentation. Um, is there anybody in the room who has brewed your own alcohol? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not, <laughs> not did you bring it, but uh, anybody in the dad room? Used to do dandelion wine. Your, your father used to do dandelion wine. Okay, so my dad used to do dandelion wine as well. And uh, so I've made hard cider before. Um, and I've tried dandelion wine. I've never been able to get the taste exactly like what my dad used to make. Um, dandelion wine, it's kind of an old timer thing. Um, but I can remember my father dropping us off around the Horn in Highgate and fields full of dandelions. Uh, we'd each have a five gallon pail and dad would be like, okay, I'm gonna go pick dandelions somewhere else. I'll come back when all five pails are full. Um, so. Anybody else? 
brew your own wine or brew your own beer? Yeah, wine? Yeah. So I would think that some of that activity um, may have a little bit of a historical anchor in the subject that we'll talk about today. Uh, you have to wonder why so many people would have sort of a local knowledge of brewing stuff at home. Um, and there, there is a certain f fun about it. I've done enough of it. I wouldn't say it's a hobby, um, but it is, there is something fun about it. So um, I guess I'll start with the slides. Um, but during the presentation, please, 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 if you guys have any questions, please raise your hands and ask, interact with me, interact with other people in the audience. I, I think it makes for a better presentation. So um, this started uh, with the Swanton Historical Society, uh, and I did the presentation for the Swanton Historical Society. It was a little more hands-on and in-depth and a little more risque, so I brought some of that hard cider with me <laughs> to the Swanton Historical Society. I brought one of the big carboys, um, and um, it was, you know, you, when you're talking about public liquor laws and those sorts of things, my intent wasn't to serve alcohol, um, but I didn't bring any of that with me today. Um, I d also did the Swanton Historical Society presentation with a flask. Um, my wife said that I was drinking from the flask a little too often during the presentation. <laughs> it was just water. So, um, the border, um, with us living so close to the Canadian border, uh, there's always um, situations that are going to make the news that have something to do with somebody trying to get something across the border illegally. If I were to 100% um, update this, uh, I'm sure I could go through the St. Albans Messenger or WCIX or just some, talk to some locals uh, and there would be information about somebody trying to get somebody else across the border illegally. Um, I think there was a story just last week or two or three weeks ago, hunters went over the border illegally. Um, so just by the fact that we're here, uh, so close to the border, you're going to have that sort of activity. So um, if this were a classroom, I would run my students through some of the reasons why prohibition happened. Uh, when you get into the early 1900s, uh, there are different laws that are being proposed that um, are designed to curb the use of alcohol. Uh, guys, we are somewhat at fault for this. Um, women were getting politically active at this point in time, and because of the amount of alcohol that guys drank, it was politically acceptable to change laws to try to limit um, alcohol consumption. Um, if I were to 100% update this, um, I would also have to spend a little bit of time talking about Vermont being a dry state. Um, I was shocked to learn that for significant periods of time, Vermont was actually a state that attempted to make alcohol illegal uh, well before the rest of the country. Um, again, just some historical information. Um, there's a, it becomes a national movement, and with me being a history teacher, uh, teaching government classes, it, um, well, I, I'll just I'll put it out to you guys. Is it weird that we would change the Constitution to outlaw alcohol? The founding document of the country, we're gonna change it to outlaw alcohol. Yeah. It's very newsworthy, but that's what the President is portending to do with the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just yesterday, yeah. Yes. Everybody's aware of um, the President's uh, statement about changing the Constitution. <coughs> Maybe he didn't say he wanted to change the Constitution. I think he just said that he wanted to try to <coughs> issue an executive order that would tackle a certain issue that some people um, are really into. So the um, historical information um, that uh, there, when people are doing research, if any of you have done genealogy, um, often there's a, uh, a question that you have that you want to answer. Uh, was my ancestor in this town? Did my ancestor serve in the military? Uh, what were the name of the kids? Who were the brothers and sisters? Well, when you have a history project like this, um, the question that I wanted to answer um, growing up in Highgate and with all of my relatives in Swanton um, was how much smuggling actually was going on in my hometown or in my neck of the woods. And when you get into that research, you start to um, identify family names. And 
nothing that comes up here is meant to be disrespectful to the current generation. But if you know some of the folks in Highgate or Franklin or here in St. Albans, you'll see last names um, of people that they got caught up in the smuggling and uh, they made a choice to either make a buck or they just did not like what the federal government was doing. So um, with me growing up in Highgate, I grew up around the Horn in Highgate. Um, and I worked at the Tyler Place for a number of years. Uh, also having some exposure to the Highgate Manor. Uh, the two specific questions were how much smuggling actually happened in Missisquoi Bay, and then the other one is one that I think we can have a lot of fun with, my students can have a lot of fun with. Did a historical figure like Al Capone actually come up to the Highgate Manor during the Prohibition time period? Have any of you heard that rumor that Al Capone actually came up to the manor? Yeah. yeah. So we'll talk about that um, in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'll say I want it to be true. <laughs> Many of you probably want it to be true. Uh, but we'll talk about historical information, family stories, and we'll talk about the accuracy of those things. Um, yeah? I think there's still, when people in from Canada, from uh, Mississippi Bay, we have a house just south of the bridge to Albert. You see them pull in. The okay. And the cars there. So, uh, specifically with Missisquoi Bay, um, I also like a, a little bit of archaeology, um, and if I have the opportunity, and my students have done a little bit of archaeology with my War of 1812 research, but there's a, um, underwater archaeology that could also happen. So we'll talk about Missisquoi Bay in a bit, but a historical question that I think is neat, um, are there boxes full of alcohol? at the bottom of the Siskoi Bay. Because when the boats from the federal government, sorry, when the boats from the federal government were coming, possession is nine tenths of the law, right? If you're, if you're in a canoe in Siskoi Bay and the patrol boat comes, just dump your, your loot overboard. <laughs> so if we did a little bit of underwater archeology span here, or if we did some underwater archeology span in St. Albans Bay, I think you'd find some very interesting artifacts. <laughs> so, um, booze, alcohol, it's related to personal choice, but it's also related to what other people are going to want. Uh, Highgate, Franklin, Swanton, St. Albans, Richford, we are right in the center of three large areas where an awful lot of people, whether it's legal or not, are going to be drinking. Montreal, it's legal. Boston, Illegal, New York, illegal. In order for some people to get it to Boston and New York, it's gonna come into the ports of Montreal and then it's gonna flow down um, south. Uh, that's a historical um, thing that repeats itself over and over again, <coughs> certainly during the War of 1812, but uh, during Prohibition time. Lake Champlain and the roads just north of us are huge for getting illegal alcohol into the country. So, old newspapers, um, I will admit that I keep old newspapers quite a bit. Um, you would be shocked if you went online or if you visited um, certain historical institutions with the amount of information that is available because old newspapers have been digitized. Um, and when they're digitizing them, the one that I use quite frequently is called the Northern New York Newspaper Project. <coughs> they basically digitized every single copy that they have. So you can go online, and uh, the first couple hits that I tried, I was just looking up prohibition, and I was looking up alcohol, and I wasn't getting anything specific. But with the Swanton history book, there's a couple of very specific agents who were stationed in Swanton, who I started to type in their names and do some research based on their last names. And Seward was one of the ones that first came up. Uh, so <coughs> this is from the Burlington Free Press. 1919, it's not that long after alcohol has been um, made illegal. And all, of the, all this has to do is with one single guy receiving his orders that he's gonna be stationed in Swanton and he's gonna be um, trying to prevent alcohol from entering the country. So, question for you guys. Let's say it's 1919. 
would you have obeyed the federal government? Would you have tried to get your hands on alcohol? Anybody brave enough to admit? <laughs> yes? Anybody else? Yeah? Anybody else? I have to admit, I mean, public school teacher, sorry, I think I would have broken the law too. I mean, it's alcohol, right? What business does the federal government have, have to do with somebody having a beer after work? Okay, um, so there's a lot more of these, um, and they added a lot, quite a bit to the research. So, um, you're going to see amounts of alcohol uh, come up quite a bit in the material. So four gallons. So four gallons of whiskey seized. Um, this is early in Prohibition. Four gallons actually is not a heck of a lot. Uh, if, if you're in a car for the time period, um, you could probably try to hide four gallons in different locations in the, heart, in, in the car. That's another theme that you're going to see. Uh, people would try to make secret compartments in their car and hide the alcohol wherever they could. Um, later on in the presentation, four gallons is nothing. Uh, later on in the presentation, the amount of alcohol that people are trying to smuggle in is um, it's pretty nuts. So uh, specifically Highgate Springs Road um, and the seizure happened at 2.30 in the morning. Okay, so Mr. Bean of Swanton, charged with smuggling. Again, we're October 1919, very, very early. Um, so this is itself, the headline shows quite a bit, but I'd like everybody to so recognize the name Charles Bean. Um, I'll, I'll just be quiet for a second. Can everyone read that part of the story? So he's nabbed, and he's got to go to court. But this is the this is his second time in one night. <laughs> so what does that tell you? If you want alcohol, are you going to go over the border twice in one night? What's probably happening? Why is he going over the border twice in one night? He's smuggling it in, probably, and he's got a good profit margin. Okay, he's smuggling it in, and he's got a good profit margin. So. If, if I were to ever, sorry, if I were to ever expand this, or if anybody else ever wanted to expand this research, um, we know for a fact that there were families in uh, Montreal, Boston, uh, New York, who were profiting a lot from the illegal alcohol. I would love to do some research and just to find out what their influence was and who was pulling the strings. Um, for somebody to, some, a local to get picked up twice in one night, somebody was paying him. He's not the only one. You'll also see the size of a fine in some of the stories, that, in some of the articles that I have come up. The fine for this is generally $500. So think of $500 today versus $500 back then. Locals probably aren't paying $500. Again, just a headline. The uh, story itself kind of uh, delivers all the information you need. We're still in 1919. The border agents are trying to do their job. They're being paid to work the border and to try to make sure that alcohol doesn't come down. So, uh, something else that you're going to see throughout the course of the presentation is that um, Swanton is not alone. So I believe the headquarters for the border agents is actually here in St. Albans. Uh, the border agents are going over to Richford. Um, they're up in Highgate. But you'll notice that they're also, there's border agents over in Rouse's Point, New York. Um, they're trying to coordinate their efforts to the best that they can. Uh, but 
there's just the, there's the law, and then there's reality. Again, reality is a lot different from what the law of, laws and templates. So uh, I had asked everybody to take a look at the amounts. So in this specific case, you're talking 12 one-gallon containers. Period. Sorry. Period. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And in many cases, they um, will carry it between properties so that somebody else can try to pick it up. It's like a drop-off. Oh, yeah. So the electric car wouldn't be the technology that we have today. I believe that's a reference to the line that they would have had between Swanton and St. Albans. So the, the, the actual... Um, it's not really the train, but it's the trolley. Maybe they need a little bit of alcohol to warm the body. <laughs> So uh, 28 quart containers of Canadian whiskey. Family name here in Franklin County still. Again, there's no historical judgments. The Barneys were probably doing this too. So we'll spend a little bit of time on this one. Everybody can hear me fine? So we'll spend a little bit of time on this one. This one becomes um, kind of a historical anchor for me because I did grow up in Highgate and I worked at the Tyler Place for so long. If you guys are familiar with the Tyler Place or Shipyard Bay or that area of Franklin County. Um, so Missisquoi Bay is right on the border. Uh, in a little bit, I have some slides. I'll, I'll show you what establishments or what buildings would have been interested in getting alcohol. Um, but so. 10, 20 gallon cakes. <laughs> so the amounts are rising. That's a lot more than what somebody can carry. But also take a look at the Chevalier family, the Gamaches, and the Bertrands. <laughs> Folks, those families still live there. They're still up around Shipyard Bay. The Chevalier's well drilling is right there. The Bertrands lived up on the hill. Um, so the historical connection, I have to admit, and again, no disrespect to any family, I just, it, it almost tickled me to come across this research. Um, the Bertrand boys, some of those graduated in the same class with me at MVU. Uh, the Chevaliers, I played basketball with some of the Chevaliers. Um, you, I just put in a new well for us. <laughs> Yeah, Eli's great. I th he was one of my students at MBU. Yeah. On the other side of the coin, though, the collector's name is Corliss. Yes. My wife is related to the Corliss. So we were on that side. She were on that side. I was kind of happy to not see that any Barneys were on the confiscation side of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> so you, your family can make your own judgment about it. So, um, Google Maps, uh, I don't know if you guys use Google Maps, but in the classroom, um, I find that Google Maps is, a, is great for these sorts of presentations. It just helps um, ground people in what the geography is. So, um, I grew up around the Horn here in Highgate. The Tyler Place would be basically in this area here. A lot of people ice fish in this location. This is Swanton. This is the Missisquoi Bay Bridge, Alberg. Um, and the color for Google Maps actually kind of makes the point. Um, folks, I deliberately took the border. Uh, when you use Google Maps, you can take certain features off. Um, the border agents, they're basically trying to stop alcohol in forests, in back roads, farmer's fields, farmer's barns, and as we've already talked about, cars going north and south along the border. So just another, a little bit more of a close-up view. Yeah, 
on the left on the left hand side over here, this would be the border station. This is an old road. This is Ram Road in Highgate. Uh, this is Ballard Road. Uh, this is an old logging road. Morse's line would be way over here. I believe some of the Rainville family live here. Folks, border agents, you are going to have to um, employ a ton of border agents to try to prevent alcohol from getting through. And that's not even over to the Richford area. Um, it's, it's just impossible. They're, they're going to catch people, but it's almost like running water through a, through a filter. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I don't think there's anything necessarily uh, distinct about this slide, uh, but I just wanted to show. So we're not even a year past the 1919 slides, um, and they're talking about uh, liquor being picked up. It's the Hilliker family, the Hemingways, Monet's, Grignes, Bashaw's. The bail is $500. So to that comment, um, the Canadian officials, um, to their credit, they speak up and they don't necessarily give a moral judgment as to whether or not banning alcohol is a good thing or bad thing, but they just want to report on the reality. Canadian officials says laws be, being violated hundreds of times daily. So hundreds of times daily could be you paying a teenager or somebody who's close to graduating just to run up over the border to a family member just over the border to bring alcohol back over. Or it could be one of these larger outfits that's running cars. Maybe they know somebody in the train uh, or a boat. But so where, whereas the first part of the presentation has to do a lot with cars, we'll get into the trains and we'll get into the boats a little bit later. What's that? The businesses that probably did care in Canada were the ones that were getting Americans driving over the border and selling them alcohol. Thanks, sir. Yeah. How much was a gallon of uh, liquor worth when they brought it in? That's a great question. If it's a $500 fine, it was really peanuts probably compared to what they got for the liquor. Um, I could throw a number out there, but I'm sure it would be wrong. It's supply and demand. So the more the border agents tried to clamp down on the illegal smuggling, the higher the price would go. So um, there might be one of these newspaper stories that answers your question, but I don't have the uh, answer off the top of my head. So um, I mentioned that one of the earlier uh, topics uh, that I wanted to answer was the extent of the smuggling in Missisquoi Bay, and that newspaper story that had the Gamache family, the Chevaliers. Um, so again, Google Maps view. Uh, anybody in Canada would have an easy route through the bay. But I also wanted to answer the question, to what extent was there more smuggling in the southern portion here, down by Maquam? Uh, and there's going to be a slide in a second that sort of explores whether or not anybody smuggling in Missisquoi Bay really would have had the opportunity to move a little bit south. Uh, I'm just curious, um, are people able to recognize these two locations up by Missisquoi Bay or in Missisquoi Bay? This Fan Fantasia was, I mean, I've heard of Fantasia. Was that a place that people used to go and are already in? Um, my understanding of Fantasia being 43 and talking to people who are a little bit older than me, that um, people used to roller skate in here? Roller skate, okay, roller skate. Okay. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, I don't know if that was the purpose, but these photos are from the 20s and 30s, so the building structure is there. And if alcohol is illegal and Vantasia is on this part of the bay, you, you have to wonder, and the Chevalier family... Don't tell them I said that. But if they're right here and they're getting 20 kegs of alcohol, you have to wonder if there's parties happening on the bay. You have to wonder if there's parties happening at Fantasia. Yep. Part of the background, there wasn't any bridge there at all. It's just a very, going from what's that? You're talking about over here? Yeah. yeah. No bridge. I, I explored that with my research, too. So the 
Um, this bridge is put in in 1938. This would be the old Missisquoi Bay Bridge. This is a current Google Maps view. So just going back, um, kind of focusing in on this area here. Because part of my research, romanticizing it a little bit, like I wanted there to be, maybe not yachts, but larger ships smuggling alcohol and the Border Patrol agents going after these guys in Missisquoi Bay. Um, that's probably incorrect. Um, the reason why that's incorrect is because of the train trussels here. Um, this ridge isn't in until 1938, which is after Prohibition. Uh, obviously, this construction is, is new. Uh, this is put in in either the early 1950s or, or sorry, 1850s or early 18, 1860s. So you might think that a boat would be able to go underneath, but if you've seen that bridge, really the only thing that's going to be able to make it through or under is a small canoe or maybe some rowboats. Uh, about halfway over, um, there might be an open space or two, but generally speaking, as far as my, in my research and my interest, um, I wanted to be able to see in the historical research that there were large vessels involved. But just this one slide kind of makes a point. Um, canoes, yes, but larger ships, no. Yeah? Uh, I believe it's shown in your photograph where you can go look today. There's a turntable affair yes. in the center. Yeah. So that, that'll, uh, that'll accommodate a fairly wide vessel going through there. I'm not sure the distance of it, but it, it would take those early canal boat size boats and any any motorboat and all that sort of thing could go through that that channel. They just have to make a deal with the guys to keep it open. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that happened. I'm sure that happened. Was there another comment? A bottle of liquor would have opened it. <laughs> uh, I didn't find that in the research. But. So these are some of the other buildings that are up in Missisquoi Bay at the time. Um, I'm very familiar with this structure. Either this structure is still there or the most recent version of it is still there. Um, this is uh, right at the Shipyard Bay area um, near the Tyler place. And um, so if you have the structure that became known as Fantasia or Fantasia, and then you've got the Bayview Hotel in Highgate Springs. And you've got this beach that is just six miles from the Canadian border. If you want your booze, or even if you don't want your booze, but you know you can make a heck of a profit, would you pay some kid to run a motorboat or a rowboat over the border and make a huge profit when he comes back and sell to locals or sell to a bar that wants to serve their, serve the people who frequent their establishment. So some of these photos um, are available uh, with the UVM landscape change program. Some of them are on the Swanton Historical Society website. And I think the Highgate Historical Society has some of these as well. So just getting back to uh, some of the historical uh, information that was available in the newspapers. Dozens of cases. So I'm not a car guy. Um, for me, uh, I'm very happy when I put the key in the ignition and the car starts. Um, but there is a museum in upstate New York which uh, does focus in on car history. Um, there are a number of different types of cars uh, that the smugglers are trying to use. They're probably interested in speed, and they're probably interested in cars that don't make a heck of a lot of noise. Uh, if they're making a rum run during the evening, they don't want a loud engine. Uh, they want somebody who knows the roads, uh, but this is just, um, so Hudson Car, Indian Pale Liquor, and um, this is one of the slides, I won't spend too much on this, but a Massachusetts car, and I think it's mentioned that it's a Massachusetts car somewhere over here as well. Um, this is one of those slides, I would specifically use this as a research question 
to find out which families were paying the locals to get the booze over the border. So again, earlier we were just talking about what people could put on their bodies. Uh, now we're up to 12 cases, 11 cases. If I'm going too long, but I mean, the, the information is just, folks, we're, we're not even out of 1920 yet. So the Swanton Historical Society um, and sw the town of Swanton has two published history books. The second history book um, was published uh, more recently compared to the first and was able to uh, publish pictures of the border agents um, doing their job. So. I was actually able to use the Swanton History Book to get the names of the agents and then using the names of the agent, agents, that's where I was able to type it in uh, online. Most, this is most yep. of the time when we think, think and talk about prohibitions, we think of, of uh, parties and speakeasy and you know, a bunch of guys drinking. But uh, I was just thinking about uh, Fortunes that may have been made by people who today are outside the citizens whose real wealth started way back then during Prohibition, just as just as the mafia families clean up their money later on and, and started legitimate business. So, um, again, not to besmirch any family name, but as a history teacher, I've often heard that um, Joe Kennedy. Uh, earned a lot of his money uh, with rum running. Yeah. Uh, and um, if I can promote a, an HBO series, I think it was HBO. Um, God, I'm forgetting the name of the series now. Um, Steve Buscemi uh, plays a rum runner in the, an HBO series where uh, he's an elected official and he's actually one of the guys who's running rum over the border. He's paying the guys to come to the border. So um, this is the aerial view of Swanton. Uh, the original uh, border station was actually in Swanton. It was not in Highgate. It actually gets moved uh, up into this location later on. And then later in the 1930s, the border station is actually built up in Highgate. I, I don't want to push people. I don't want to push with people's lunches too much. So. Uh, there are some specific things I would mention, but I want to get to the boats, and I want to get to the trains, too. Um, so, just something else. If you have one of these cars, think of your car today, and you're trying to hide something from other people. Just think of the different places that you would try to hide it. Uh, would you put it in a toolkit in the trunk? Uh, would you put a, a um, secret compartment underneath the vehicle? Is there somewhere along the wheels or actually where the engine is? Is there somewhere under the seats? Um, another a chapter in a book would be the number of different places that people could hide their alcohol. Okay, so um, I wanted to specifically uh, just spend a moment on this one because I believe, yes, this is the first one that I was able to find uh, where the border agents are actually shooting at the guys who are trying to flee. So um, it's not part of my research uh, because it happened so far away from Swanton and, and um, Rouse's Point, St. Albans, but there is one case in, the, in um, the Northeast Kingdom where the border agents, they actually, um, they don't shoot to send a message, they shoot to kill. Uh, and they kill one of the uh, rum runners. And I think, I'd have to um, double check this, but I think it was just a teenage kid. Um, and there becomes this huge discussion about public policy. If we are all alive in 1920, 1923, 1924, and half of us are drinking, are we really going to want border agents shooting at a 19-year-old running rum? I mean, so there's a, there becomes a, quite a discussion about just how we can make it illegal, but just how much should we be enforcing the law? 
again, uh, Swanson Historical Society, have, they have some good images of the uh, rum run, or sorry, of the border agents. If I were, if anybody wanted to continue the research, these names would be other names that you could put in to the search functions on the uh, historic newspaper site. So um, there were some purists. Uh, I did want to take a couple of slides. Um, there were some organizations that were um, paying money for ads in newspapers, uh, trying to get people to behave, to not embrace alcohol. Uh, this is an example of one of those newspaper ad ads, the Vermont Anti-Saloon League. They're just talking about uh, all of the known areas where alcohol is coming over the border from Highgate to St. Armand's, or from St. Armand's to Highgate, excuse me. Uh, it's a pretty extensive ad, and if you take a look at the historic newspapers, those ads uh, run quite a bit as you get into 1922, 1923, and later. So the Canaan Line House is an example of what I think a couple of you were mentioning. Uh, in some cases, they were built right on the border. Uh, so if somebody's in Vermont or they're in the United States, their illegal activity is literally just a matter of feet because they can go from one side of the building to the other, enjoy their alcohol, and then return to their home country. And have they broken the law? Have they broken the spirit of the law? And as you were mentioning, Queen Lil's in uh, Richford. So uh, these are a little bit further to the east um, and this would definitely be, my mom lives in Richford, Richford right now. Uh, at some point in time, I'll probably research this a little bit more. I don't believe this building is still standing, correct? So, Al Capone. Again, the, the kid in me, the researcher in me, wants to be able to tell all of these romantic stories about rum runners and the big guys were coming up and they were uh, really interested in making sure that one uh, shipment made it. Um, the local story that we have all heard that Al Capone spent a night at the Highgate Manor is probably false. Um, there's quite a bit of evidence to support the idea that the manor was involved in hosting parties during the 1920s. But for somebody like Al Capone to come on up and be personally involved is possible but it's unlikely. Is, is there, you want to add to that at all? Because I brought my students to the Highgate Historical Society and we kind of chatted about that. It doesn't make much sense. Yeah. It would be cool if we could find that information, but we haven't found the information. So um, I'm also not a music guy, uh, but there are nationally known performers uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Geraldine Farrar, uh, she's over in Rouse's Point, uh, and she's got a, uh, a gig down in Rutland, Vermont. So her train route is going to take her from Rouse's Point over the lake through Franklin County, and they find 40 bottles of champagne. Um, so Farrar was a fa fairly well-known national performer. She'd been on Broadway. I think she was actually in a couple of movies as well. Um, and yeah, it's just neat to think that all of these struggles are going on and their local families trying to get alcohol over the border, but there's also national uh, people nationally who are performing. They want their booze. If they get caught, they have to pay the public price. Another image of Ms. Barack. Okay, so um, a little bit of St. Albans information and kind of the growth of Prohibition. Um, so, whereas we're talking about cars early in the presentation, we just talked about trains. Um, you know, if, if you're somebody running the trains, there's probably quite a few nooks and crannies that you can hide alcohol in in the train. So now, um, the lake. So, this becomes, because I also have a history in, uh, or, or, or a huge interest in naval history, uh, this part of the presentation is something that uh, I would love to research a little bit more. So down in St. Albans Bay, there were three boats that were used to go up near Missisquoi Bay, excuse me, or over to Rouse's Point. And their job um, wasn't to patrol the shores necessarily, but 
as more and more money gets involved in the illegal alcohol business, people are running boats up and down Lake Champlain. They would load up the boats in Canada, they'd come south through um, basically the islands, and they might stop in New York, they might try to make their way all the way down to Burlington, but the idea is you can only get so much alcohol on your body, you can only get so much alcohol in a car, how much alcohol can you fit into a boat? There's stories um, that on the tail ends of the boats, they would actually, so these are the patrol boats, but just imagine a rum running boat with no real alcohol in the boat itself, but with a long line running behind the boat, almost like an anchor that they would have beneath. And these guys who are patrolling Lake Champlain, they would actually look for boats that were kind of tilted down and tipped um, because there's so much weight that they're dragging underneath the water. So um, the newspapers gave quite a bit of information, uh, the newspapers from the time gave quite a bit of information about what the uh, border agents were up against. So if they're stationed here in St. Albans Bay and they're patrolling this whole area, um, if large families are running alcohol, it's not just one boat or two boats. There are several boats, uh, and some of these boats come up multiple times. <coughs> Rum boat is found after being stolen. The booze was returned to the boat and the craft was turned over to the US to make the So again, Google, Google Maps gives you a good indication of just what they're up against. Um, coming up here in the Pong, coming up here to the right of Isle of Mont, or to the, uh, the west of Isle of Mont. That's just a huge amount of water that they have to control. Uh, the Vermont Historical Society has a really nice article uh, that was published several years ago that goes into a lot of detail uh, about what these guys are doing. Um, the, probably the, I mentioned underwater archaeology. Uh, I know up by the Tyler Place, Lake Champlain is about 14 to 16 feet deep, so <laughs> underwater archaeology there is probably doable. I don't know. How deep is St. Albans Bay? Twenty to forty feet. So, in the article that was published by the Vermont Historical Society, underwater archaeology might be worth it here in St. Albans Bay. And if you know, you have to decide whether or not researching something that's ninety years old or hundred year, years old is worth it. But there's stories of the border agents using St. Albans Bay as basically a uh, trash repository for not tens or dozens, but hundreds or thousands of bottles that they had confiscated, cracked on the sides of the boats, or just threw overboard. So right here in St. Albans Bay, the border agents were, um, they were using St. Albans Bay as a place to get rid of a lot of the alcohol. I mean, what are they, once they confiscate the alcohol, what are they gonna do with it? They're not gonna hold on to it, it's illegal. So I imagine some of them may have took a little bit of the uh, evidence taking a little bit of the evidence. So um, there's a lot of money, folks, in this. And when there's a lot of money, I mean, when people are able to pay off a $500 bail in one night and get the guy back on the roof, there's a lot of money in this. And um, not only is there a lot of money, some of these guys' lives start to be in danger. Uh, you'll see some, there are a good number of slides here. We're up to 1927. but. Um, if a, if a buck can be made, some of these people aren't gonna want some border agent getting in the way. And they'll physically threaten them, and in some cases, they'll harm them. So just to ground everybody with a little bit of history, um, 1927, you have the flood. Uh, this image is uh, with the Swanton Historical Society. This is uh, basically the bridge going over from the park. Um, this is how high the water was during the flood. If you're one of these guys, if you're one of these ladies cleaning up the trash, 1927 flood, don't you think you should go home and you've earned a beer for the day? Your government says no. Jack Kendrick um, was one of the captains. 
uh, of the boats on Lake Champlain. Okay, so I, I find this one really, really interesting because if you've ever been on the ferries uh, on Lake Champlain, um, if you've ever been to the Sheldon Museum and you've seen the ferry that they have there, uh, just imagine the ferries being constructed where uh, you can park the cars on them. Uh, for, and not parking cars to get across the lake, but parking cars on for a little bit of travel. Um, well, so they seize five booze cars on Vermont. That's not on the Vermont side of the border. That's on the ferry, the Vermont. And if you think of all of the storage space here in the back, um, wh whoever did this, they didn't want to get caught, so they put the cars in there. And uh, the border agents, somebody tipped off the border agents. And in some cases, the tipping off could have been done by a rival rum runner. If you're making your money and you want the agents to leave you alone, you cut a deal, turn in the other guy. I suspect that that's something that probably happened here. 480 bottles. Yeah, when the ice freezes, when, when there's snow on the ground. I'm trying to imagine when a time when St. Albans Bay would have looked like that. So again, talking about the ice. So we're up to 1929, uh, the Richelieu River, on average 40 boats a month were going through customs. Customs patrolmen drowned while chasing rumbo. So again, as there's a lot of money, their lives are at risk. Babcock, he's the patrolman. His body is still somewhere on the lake. Body not yet recovered. Uh, so, fishing spots would be uh, different locations where they would try to intercept the, sm the smugglers. No, we're up to 1931. If you guys are getting hungry, we're almost done. <laughs> um, so, this would be another point of research that I'd like to um, take a look at in the future. There was one particular boat, the Midnight Sun, uh, that came up several times in the research. It was a boat that uh, customs agents knew about. In some cases, they would seize it. When they seized it, they would hold on to it for a little while. They would put it out to auction. If it goes out to auction, who's going to buy it? The rum runners are the ones who are going to buy it. So that boat gets reused and reseized a couple of times. Motorboats, often Cumberland Head. 70 cases of Canadian beer, 50 cases of wine. <coughs> Rum runner knocks officer into the lake with a baseball bat. <laughs> I mean, that's something that literally is right out of the movies, right? I mean, don't get in the way. Let us do our illegal activity. So there were three boats that the uh, border agents here in St. Albans had. Uh, one was called Old Pops, the, uh, another one was called the Flopsy Jane. I don't think the third one necessarily had a name. And one of the research rabbit holes that I went down, that third ship may have been one that was seized by the um, uh, border agents that had been running alcohol to start with. Again, just trying to, so we're up to 1932. They're just trying to keep track of what they can. At this point in time, I had to be selective because there were so many. I don't think that's one. 1,000 cases of AL seized on a canal boat. So um, the Customs House in Swanton um, got moved a little bit further 
a uh, little bit closer to the border. Uh, again, these images are available at the Historical Society. It would be further up in this location here, but eventually, if you follow the um, Spring Street, uh, they're going to put the border up in the up by Highgate. But that's not a project that happens immediately. Isn't there a story about uh, the Cowboys selling fields? Oh, I don't. I, I hadn't encountered that. One. So to finish up, uh, when you get into 1932, 1933, uh, the 21st Amendment is passed, which basically repeals and uh, revokes some of the information from uh, the, uh, when they outlawed alcohol to start with. Um, so this is something that uh, eventually, when I'm done with War of 1812 stuff, uh, when I'm done with researching uh, Native American history, I probably would like to return to this uh, because it does seem to be, uh, yes, it's dangerous, but it also seems to be somewhat of a a playful time period in Vermont history. Um, I would encourage any of you, if you have uh, family stories, uh, relatives who were involved in the, uh, in the trade, even if it's just you heard that the old family farm used to be on the Canadian border and um, the stories go that somebody would drive in, sorry, somebody would drive in with a uh, car at night and leave alcohol on the family farm, that sort of thing happened quite a bit. Um, I would imagine it happened in Richford often, it happened around the Horn and Highgate and Franklin. Uh, Morse's line was notorious for smuggling, but they're gonna use any avenue that they can to try to get that alcohol uh, into the United States. So uh, that's it for my presentation. Um, thank you for coming, hope you enjoyed it. And uh... <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Thinking back, I actually think the late 50s, early 60s, high school. The age drinking in Vermont was 21. The age drinking age in Canada and New York was 18. So we spent a lot of time traveling to a place. <laughs> <laughs> and by the Hotel Saxony in Charleston. Oh, yeah. Very popular place. And also, are, you, are you asking for a show of hands or nothing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was probably it was probably a really awkward situation too for the military guys who fought in World War One. Imagine serving overseas and being involved in that war, and then coming home and alcohol is illegal. Like, I would imagine one of the prime groups that said to heck with the federal law would be some of the guys who served in World War I. One negative aspect, group from the military, and not over to the process point was actually, I think it was either four or five, they would kill in a car Where did that happen? They were in South Carolina. Um, there were some people who that was their primary motivation. Um, if you mix that in with women getting the right to vote, um, I think there is, and this would be neat if this is something that we do for the Swanton Historical Society, women getting the right to vote, I want to put this right, um, it was a way for them, um, outlawing alcohol, right. to try to make things right. right. Because so many of their husbands were abusive, so many of their husbands were inappropriate, that if you outlaw alcohol, maybe they will, maybe they will behave. Um, so there is a there is a legitimate reason for women wanting that to be um, illegal. But as far as grain goes, as, as soon as World War One ended, that no longer became a, a, an excuse. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I, I married up in my uh, life. I live in Franklin, and you, you mentioned uh, Marshall Pine. Oh yeah. But my wife's uncle was a border patrol agent back then. And some of the stories that he would tell just makes your hair stand up. But among many of them, he said, we used to hide in a ditch just the other side of the border with a board with spikes came to it. And we, we saw, we hear a car coming, we'd pull this board across the road so that 
and got out of his place <coughs> and, and catch him. But, you know, and he just went on and on. It's just amazing. Why the man died of old age, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if some people did that to the border agents as well. I mean, if their primary method in some of these back roads, Morse's line, if you can take out the cars that are patrolling them. Yeah. So I would, um, if people are interested, whether or not it's Franklin or Highgate or St. Albans, um, I think one thing that teachers are trying to do and something that the Vermont Folk Life Center is trying to do is uh, train us as educators to capture a lot of these old stories. Uh, and there's oral histories that can be recorded and Ron, I think you've done them with the Swanton Historical Society. You've done them with, with my students. So before those stories can't be recorded anymore, um, I think it's, it's my duty, it's my students' duty. We need to record those things so that future research, you know, that's a, the story about the spikes. That, means, that should be recorded, you know. And there's Morse's line. Um, an entire presentation could probably be done just on that road. Any other comments, questions? Thank you. Thank you.